Third Notebook, Massacres, from the 15th of December, 1914, to the 23rd of December, 1914. It was the evening after the day when their attack order had been cancelled. The time was 8 o'clock and the soldiers were passing the time in their billets. Many had already bedded down while others were writing letters home or playing cards by candlelight. Some were even singing. Then, without warning, an orderly appeared and cried out with a voice that immediately caught their attention. He announced, Here are your orders. The regiment is relieved. You're going to have some rest at Mazingar. Departure at four in the morning. Blankets rolled up horseshoe style on your knapsacks. This brought an explosion of joy in the billets. The Palus laughed, clapped and cried. They were happy to be alive and to escape the horrors of war, even if for only a little while. Many were so eager to leave that they rolled up their blankets immediately, even if it meant being cold the rest of the night. They were so excited that at 3 a.m. they were already on their feet and moving around. Finally, the sergeant called them to shape up, and the soldiers stood at the ready. Then they were suddenly handed 250 cartridges for each man, just like the day before. Confusion and questions emerged from the Poilus. They received the explanation that this was to lighten the regimental truckload, but it was not convincing. Then they were each handed rations for two days, which was strange considering that Mazingar was barely six kilometers away. Finally, they were lined up by force to the right and they could see the direction they were being taken, and it was not the direction of Mazingar. They were following the same railroad track they had followed the day before yesterday. At that moment, the officers informed them that the attack was set for dawn. They had been played a despicable trick. Bartha's comments that perhaps it had been because the higher-ups feared a revolt from the soldiers. But if that was the case, then they were giving them too much credit by believing that the soldiers would protest on their way to the front lines. At dawn, they were in position at the first line of trenches. It was occupied by territorials, peaceful and smartly dressed. The soldiers envied the old age of these gentlemen for if they themselves had been older, then they would have been exempt from attacks. Barthas lifted his head over the parapet and saw nothing but a vast plain of sugar beet fields. At about 800 meters, they could barely make out where the ground rose, but no signs of the enemy could be seen. 60 meters to their right was the rail line they had followed in the night. It continued towards the town of oshile la -Bazé which was occupied by the Germans. The first of its red-roofed houses could be seen between five and six hundred meters away. The wait was eternal and day had broken. The Poilus hoped for some counter-order that would take them back to Anneka. It seemed impossible that they could be ordered to advance towards German positions in broad daylight over such open fields and across such a vast distance. Only a madman could think it would work. During their wait, their superiors sped at the wildest rumors in order to boost morale. One said that a band of ferocious Hindus from their British allies was lurking, hidden in the fields right in front of them, with their cutlasses in their teeth. Another said that it was unlikely that there would even be any enemies there to meet them, since the territorials strolled around peaceful in the open every day, without drawing a single enemy shot. In brief, these rumors seem to say that their job would be to simply walk peacefully across a field and occupy abandoned trenches. But these were all false. Their superiors lied to them shamelessly. Bartha says that later Captain Hudel would confirm to him that they had all truly been sacrificed. Their regiment was to carry out a series of attacks for three days with no hope of success, just in order to draw in enemy forces and cover up an English attack in La Bazé and a French one in Arras. Captain Houdel showed Barthas the written order. It simply said the following. Attack whatever the cost, paying no attention to losses. The section leaders are responsible for the execution of this order. This order that sent them to their deaths did not even have a signature. 
It was anonymous, like a note to a servant. Those that were responsible for the sacrifice of their men were not even brave enough to show their names. But these orders and discoveries come from the future, so now we return to the present. They suddenly received the order to affix bayonets. Barthas shivered with fear. He said that he always considered himself to have been sensitive, one whose heart bled easily and who rejected violence to the point that he often turned his foot away so as not to step on an insect. The idea of being thrown into savage hand-to-hand -hand combat against others that were just as unfortunate and miserable as himself terrified him. Barthas looked at the comrades around him. To him they all seemed to be passive, quiet, as if they were actors preparing to enter the stage. They did not seem to understand the situation they were in. He looked at the two school teachers in his squad. One, Mondier, had drunk copious amounts of alcohol, perhaps for bravery, and seemed to be entirely focused on not falling asleep. The other teacher, Izard, smoked cigarette after cigarette, but alas, those would be his last cigarettes, and also his last day among the living. It was eight in the morning when their batteries of 75s opened an impressive barrage against the German positions. It was impressive, but completely insufficient to protect their attack. After only a few minutes, the order forward came down the trench. The soldiers thought they would all climb out of the trench simultaneously and move out in a skirmish line. But it turned out that their command had had another and far worse idea. From the main trench, another narrow trench extended forward, about 15 meters, and at its end it had a few crudely dug steps. They were going to exit the trench single file through that narrow way. They would be funneled, and it is doubtful that a sap of 15 meters would be of great use when they had to cross hundreds upon hundreds of meters of completely open fields. The first section that was unlucky enough to be placed first in line started to climb the steps. Barthas' section was next. There was a light fog that the pale sun had not yet cleared, and which, combined with the great distance, made it so that the Germans did not see them move at first. But barely twenty men had stepped out when one machine gun started firing, then another one, then a third. Bullets fell all around the mouth of the trench, making the soldiers lower their heads. A man in the squad in front of them was shot right through the shoulder and started spurting an incredible amount of blood, like a macabre fountain. Barthas knew the man would die if he did not receive immediate medical attention, but there were no stretcher bearers in sight, and they were not allowed to stop. They had to step over their wounded comrade splashing through his blood. Everyone knew they were running towards death with no hope of success. They were nothing more than targets for machine guns. Bertha says that if their leaders had been in the Kaiser's payroll and had the job of destroying the French forces, they wouldn't have acted any differently. He also comments that if the Germans had waited a few minutes before opening fire, then the entire company, perhaps even the entire battalion, would have gotten out of the trench, and their death that day would have been in the hundreds. But the Germans were gripped by panic, and fired too early, and so only two of the company's sections got out. He recalls that at the entrance to the forward trench was their captain Houdel. He was upright, pale, and his face was frozen. Their squad, the Minerva squad, as Houdel called it, passed right before his eyes and he did not even recognize them. His mind seemed to have left present reality and was somewhere far away. Barthas comments that some would have been surprised that the captain was not at the head of his men, but now High Command had come up with a new structure. The colonel marched with his reserve battalion, the commandant with his reserve company, the captain with his support section, and the section chief with his relief squad. It was the corporal the one that had to march at the head of the squad. 
The sergeants took up the rear to move along the laggards and shoot them down with their revolvers if they felt it was necessary to do so. That day, Barthas was the second or honorary corporal of the squad, so he was not at the front of the squad but in the line. The first corporal was the young army man from Toulouse. As soon as each of them left the trench, they ran towards the railway embankment and flattened themselves against the slightly elevated slope. But it was nothing more than imperfect cover against the bullets that were being fired from the windows and rooftops of the town of Auchy by machine guns that they could see just as well as they could see them. Just as Barthas arrived out of breath to the slope, he saw one of the men that had taken cover get hit in the back with a bullet. He would never forget the sight of that hole, as if it had been made with a drill. There was a little smoke from burning cloth and flesh. The man jumped violently and then died with nothing more than a groan. Seized with fear, Barthas ran along the embankment under a steadily increasing torrent of bullets, looking for a spot with better cover. Now they were all stretched out across two to three hundred meters of railroad track, completely suppressed and immobile. From the trench behind them, the captain cried out to advance in a skirmish line. They crawled a few meters forward, but could advance no more. The captain was being pressured by the commandant and was growing impatient. Barely half the company had gotten out of the trench. Then, from the trench, a rough voice issued a terrible threat. If the section did not move forward, then they would fire on them. Terrified, they crawled a little farther along the embankment like earthworms. Some in front tried to form a skirmish line, but those who left the slope were immediately killed by the bullets. Right at that moment, an orderly, with a folded up piece of paper in his hand and moving as low to the ground as possible, came near to Barthas and said, Hey, are you scared? He had barely finished the sentence when a bullet went through his chest. He fell forward and his face went into the dirt. He rolled over onto his back with a convulsion. His face immediately grew pale. His eyes got cloudy and blood started to trickle from his lips. He did not say a word, simply stuck out his hand towards them. Barthas and the man next to him took it, but by the time they touched his fingers, he was already dead. It seemed that the ones that commanded the assault had finally understood that the men were not immune to bullets and could not advance under such a hailstorm. With his raspy voice, Captain Houdel called out to them to try to get to another trench they had not noticed before. It began at about the same level they were at, and extended towards the enemy lines. But it was over 80 meters away from where Barthas was, an unimaginably long distance under such a storm of fire. He could be killed several times over while trying to cross such a distance. And if Barthas even managed to reach the trench, it could very well be too shallow to offer any good cover, or it could even be filled up with earth or water. However, their position was untenable, Due to the low height of the slope they were taking cover in, and the higher angle from which the Germans were firing, they were little more than silhouetted targets, and every now and then a bullet would find its victim, and a man would be killed or wounded. Their corporal, the small man from Toulouse, had had his arm shattered by a bullet. The wounded man found the strength to crawl back to the original trench from which their attack had started leaving a bloody trail behind him. And just like that, Barthas had now become the primary corporal, but when he looked around, he could not find his squad. There was only one, Ferrier from Peria, whose family had lived in the countryside outside the town. They took counsel together and hesitated to leave. Several of those that tried to get to the safety of the trench had not made it. But then, a bullet that looked explosive to Barthas landed a few centimeters from his face, splattering him with mud. Barthas then told his comrade, Ferrier, old friend, I think that if we want to see the church tower of Periac again, we need to get out of here. 
So they crawled across the sugar beet field, with knees and elbows crying out in pain. When Barthas got to about twenty meters from those trenches, he found that he could not go any farther. The pain in his limbs was incapacitating, even though safety was only a few steps away. His brain then made a desperate decision, and he got up and started running, or tried to run, for his legs felt as if they were filled with lead. At this, a machine gun immediately cracked in the distance, and a salvo of bullets tore the sugar beets around him. A private Thomas, who was crawling in a furrow next to Barthas, screamed to him that he was mad and to get down, else he would get both of them killed. Despite being only a few steps away from salvation, Barthas understood that Thomas was right and threw himself to the ground. The machine gunner seemed to think he was dead and moved on to fighting elsewhere. When he reached the trench, he discovered to his disappointment that it was actually just a series of rifle pits spaced out from one another, probably meant originally for German sentinels who had kept watch at night. They were barely deep enough for a single man to flatten himself out on them, and only one of them was unoccupied. With a leap, Barthas entered it. Private Thomas had been heading towards that same pit, and when he saw that Barthas was going to steal it, he also leapt towards it and landed right on top of Barthas. Thomas was big and fat. The military had not made him skinny yet, and with his equipment he weighed about 100 kilos. Barthas, pressed against the dirt by such a weight, was suffocating, and if he had not managed to throw Thomas off with a supreme effort, he would have died right then and there. In his knapsack, Barthas had a spade, and Thomas had a pickaxe. All while lying down and with great effort, they managed to build a small protective parapet. The men in neighboring holes did the same, and they all started to link up the holes, building a small trench with which they could be protected from the machine guns. A latecomer crawled up and asked if there was room for him. They had barely answered yes when, fooled by a moment of apparent calm, the latecomer got up and ran towards them. Just as his foot was stepping over the parapet, he was riddled with bullets and fell dead. They saw the school teacher Izard from Barthas' squad, he was advancing very slowly, in a strange fashion. He told them that he was wounded in the stomach and couldn't go any farther. When they checked him, it seemed that an explosive bullet had shredded his guts. In his cruel agony, poor Izard did not offer a single word of complaint. When someone asked him if he was suffering, he did not want to make them sad and simply answered, No, I'm not suffering, but I'm cold. They all knew it was the cold hand of death. Someone rolled up a blanket and threw it out to Izard so he could spread it out over himself. Another soldier that was crawling suddenly leapt up and fell right in the middle of them. To their horror, they saw that he had almost no face left. An explosive bullet had blown up his mouth, blasting out his cheeks, shattering his jaws and ripping out his tongue a piece of which was still hanging. Blood poured in the fountains from the horrible wounds, and the man was still alive and conscious. They opened several packets of bandages and tried to wrap what was left of the man's face to stop the bleeding. Then, suddenly, someone recognized him as Gachet, a member of Barthes' squad. At this, the wounded man nodded, confirming that he was indeed Gache. Barthas was shocked that he had not recognized a man from his own squad, but in the pitiful state he was in, even his mother would have had trouble recognizing him. Gache showed incredible willpower throughout his ordeal, without expressing the slightest sign of weakness or complaint. Eventually, during the evening, they would finally manage to get him to a first aid station. Barthas then saw that some of his comrades, furious at the use of explosive bullets by the Germans, pulled out bullets from their casings and reloaded them with a point down. 
It seemed that that was all that was needed in order to make them expand when they hit something. And that, for Barthas, was the essence of war. With the reprisals it provoked, soon all humanity was lost. Finally, darkness and fog spread over the fields and the machine guns fell silent. They could now show themselves openly. With the coming of night, the soldiers expected stretcher bearers and medics to arrive to take care of their wounded and bring them back to their aid stations. But none appeared. It seemed they did not bother for such little things. At this moment, Barthas mentions that in the 280th Regiment they had a chief medical officer who was a real butcher. But Barthas would talk about him later. At this complete lack of any medical help, the Poilus had to bring back their own wounded comrades, carrying them on their backs or on pairs of rifles that served as makeshift stretchers. Captain Houdel was furious at this horrible negligence. He asked that for the honor of the army, they must not say a word of this shameful business. But Bartha says that on this, Houdel had been wrong. They should have screamed loud and clear for all friends to hear and know that after a long planned attack, their army had left their wounded on the field with no help. They then rushed towards the school teacher Izard in order to help him, but he was already in a deep coma. The earth around him was soaked in his own blood. They shook his hand, but he did not recognize them. They carried him on two rifles to the first aid station, where he died almost immediately. Eventually, when they returned to Anakin, they buried him there and gathered in silence around his grave and decorated it with greenery. Barthas would be picked by the squad to write a letter of condolence to his widow, for which she thanked them sincerely. But returning to the present situation, each man searched around in the dark for his comrades, his friends, his bosses and the remnants of his squad. They greeted each other with great emotion and each one was eager to show their cloaks and knapsacks riddled with bullet holes. They found Gabriel Gilles safe and sound and their joy was so great that they threw themselves into each other's arms weeping. The men that still had some food from their rations in their knapsacks shared it fraternally with their comrades. Meanwhile, their superiors set them to work all night digging a trench at the farthest point of advance in the attack, and then made them dig a communication trench between the new trench and the original one, from which they had originally launched the attack. To motivate them, their superiors told them that if they worked hard enough, and the new trench and communicating trench were deep enough, they wouldn't attack the next day. The soldiers clung to this hope and worked hard for 12 hours, from 7 at night to 7 in the morning. Only those that had been serving at the front since the start of the war were skeptical. Mondier, the last living schoolteacher in Barthes' squad, told them, You don't know them. You'll work until you drop, and then you'll attack all the same. On the next morning, December 17th, they were all stretched out over the communication trench they had just dug, worn by the fatigue from the long, cold December night of hard work and the previous attack. Next to Barthas in the communicating trench was private second class Jordi, with whom Barthas had spent three years of compulsory military service before the war. Jordi was a fervent pacifist that, Barthas comments, had once promised him his vote in their municipal elections in Periak Minerva, but in the end had naively sacrificed him because of promises made to Jordi by the opposition, promises that were never kept. The realities of war had wiped away all previous grudges. It was no longer important. Barthas and Jordi felt nothing but heartfelt joy to see each other alive and to find each other in the same squad. During the battle, a German bullet had found Jordi. It entered through his knapsack and by all rights should have gone right through him. But two centimeters before reaching his body, the bullet hit a tin of coconut candy and ricocheted away harmlessly, saving his life. 
Jordi could not wait to tell the news in a letter to his wife, Adrienne. A few days later, Jordi would receive a parcel from his wife. When Jordi opened it, he was stunned while all the squad burst into laughter. Inside the parcel were a dozen tins of coconut candy, of all sizes and flavors, from vanilla to lemon and menthol. It turned out that when his wife read that her husband's life had been saved by a tin of coconut candy, she naively believed that there was some substance in coconut that deflected bullets. In her letter, she told him that she had gone to all the shops in their hometown in search of coconut candy and was deeply sorry that she couldn't find more. But now, let's return to that grey morning, with the men exhausted after the previous day's attacks and the night's back-breaking work. An orderly appeared and gave them terrible orders. Put on your knapsacks and get ready. We attack at three in this afternoon. The men looked at each other in shock. They had been lied to and taken advantage of, and now they were going to do it all again and relive the horrors of the previous day. Blood would flow and screams of agony would fill the air. Perhaps they would be nothing but cold corpses by nightfall. Some felt a spirit of revolt beginning to grow inside them before the cruelty of those that disposed of their lives with such indifference. Captain Houdel passed by and Barthas followed him in order to get some information. His friend and captain told him with sadness that these orders were serious and far more severe than previous ones. The day before only two companies had attacked and now their superiors wished for the entire regiment to do it. Barthas relayed these words to his comrades and they were affected deeply. Jordi had a sudden attack of colic and soiled his pants. Gilles simply said that he was going to say goodbye to his loved ones, and almost everyone else followed his example. Barthas was touched deeply by the sight of all these men, who knew they were condemned to death, being entirely focused on writing their last words to their mothers, wives, sons and siblings. Some of them were so nervous that their hands did not stop shaking, and they couldn't write their addresses in a legible hand. Barthas was as demoralized as they were, but he managed to control his nerves better, and offered help to Gilles and other comrades by writing for them. At ten minutes to three they had to hoist their knapsacks and get ready. At this early point in the war, command forced the soldiers to go into battle with all their baggage, and it was an exhausting load. Through the trench, while they waited for the attack orders, walked a man who exuded excitement and the smell of alcohol. He was Sub-Lieutenant Rodier, who Barthas comments was very keen to get his second stripe and was a volunteer for the attack. He brandished a German bayonet and bragged for all to hear that he was going to kill the Bosches with their own weapon. He would be dead a quarter of an hour later, a bullet shattered his head the moment he peered out of the trench. At five minutes to three they were ordered to fix bayonets and their artillery opened up. This fire received an immediate and violent answer from the German guns, which had all been silent the day before due to the surprise of the first attack, but were now very much so prepared. After merely five minutes of preparation with nothing heavier than the 75s, the attack was launched across a broad front. The German machine guns immediately opened fire, mowing down all those who got out, because they could not get behind any kind of cover in the open fields. Barthas was shocked by the horrifying spectacle that displayed before him, and thought about the paintings of glorious battles of the past that appeared on the pages of their history books and on the walls of their museums. There were no heroic charges now. Their great leaders did not lead their men on the attack, but were miles behind inside a bunker. The regimental flag no longer flew with the regiment. At the start of the war it had been scorched by two bullets, and almost captured by the enemy near Mulhouse, so now it was stored safely away in a cellar in Vermel. And the buglers, drummers and musicians were useless outside parades. So they served as stretcher-bearers, orderlies and batmen. So was the modern war. 
Their company was right at the front line, but Captain Hudel told the commandant that he would not move them until other companies caught up with them. Through an orderly, the commandant sent him an order to attack immediately, no matter what, and it carried a serious threat. If Hudel did not attack, it could mean his rank, his reputation for courage and honor, and perhaps even his life. But caught between his duty to obey and his responsibility over the lives of his men, the captain did not hesitate to refuse the commandant's order. This decision would end up saving the lives of many in the 21st Company that day, for they suffered insignificant losses while many other companies were badly mauled. Near their sector, a drama unfolded in the 24th Company, where the commandant was located. This was Commandant Llanas, the one that forbid his men from using safe trenches and tunnels in order to expose them to danger. The captain of that company had arrived four or five days earlier from a Zouave regiment. This man had protested against the orders for an attack that was against all common sense and doomed to fail. But he chose to follow his duty to obey and hurled himself forward. The Zouave captain could not take a couple of steps before he fell to the ground, dead. In the trench, the men wept and pleaded. Some asked for mercy. One said that he had three children, while another simply cried out for his mother. The commandant walked through the trench with his revolver in hand, cursing and threatening to execute all the laggards and cowards. On the floor, a lieutenant with a shattered thigh cried out in pain, and the commandant told him to shut up and stop demoralizing the men. The commandant then spotted a couple of men crouching behind a fold in the ground a few meters from the trench and ordered them to advance. The terrified men refused to move from their only place of cover, and the commandant in a fury threw himself at them, threatening them with his revolver, but suddenly he fell to the ground. His head had been pierced by a bullet. And that was the end of Commandant Lianas. Captain Hudel was immediately informed that he was the last remaining captain in the battalion, and he was now in command. Hudel immediately stopped the senseless attack. The soldiers sheathed their bayonets and instead wielded their picks and shovels throughout the night in order to expand the trenches. Those that recovered the commandant's body said that his revolver had not been loaded. Some believed that the officer had sought death in a moment of madness, as he was caught between his duty to carry out such inhumane orders and his conscience as an honest man that couldn't live with such a responsibility. Maybe, some said, he thought that his death would put an end to the assault and to the killing. In the end, no one would know his final secret thoughts. The commandant took them with him to his grave. Barthas wished that Commandant Lianas would rest in peace. The next day, the soldiers were resting in their trenches, warming themselves under the pale December sun. They were all happy to be over with the futile assaults. Captain Hudel came by to inspect their work, and he was chatting with Barthas when an orderly appeared and gave a sealed envelope to the captain. Inside it was only a piece of unsigned paper with the following message. Today, same attack order as yesterday. The time will be given later on. The news spread like wildfire, and the soldiers were furious. They were not scared of saying that they were commanded by murderers and butchers, and they all demanded that if the colonel and the general wanted them to march again, then they should put themselves at their head. A commandant de Fajols of the 4th Battalion told the colonel that he would not take responsibility for such an attack, and even had the courage to ask the general himself to come and assess the situation personally. The general came and finally saw that advancing on open ground in broad daylight would achieve nothing except a massacre for their own men. In the end, he agreed with Commandant de Fajol's suggestion to advance their trench lines at night. The attack was cancelled, 
and that was the end of those bloody assaults. Their leaders seemed to be very satisfied with the results because the Poilus had drawn a lot of German fire. Though this did not keep the French and British attacks at La Bazée and Arras from failing completely. All these attacks had been carried out according to a general plan of their headquarters staff. The soldiers had even received a daily order from General Joffre himself, the commander-in-chief of all the French forces on the Western Front. This order said that it was finally the time to throw the hated enemy out of France. Barthes commented sarcastically that Joffre was too presumptuous and in too much of a hurry, for he should not have let the enemy enter France in the first place. In order to excite their hatred and patriotism, the soldiers were also read an order from a Bavarian general to massacre all Frenchmen taken prisoner. Barthes received this with skepticism, saying that one can suppose that these orders had not been carried out to the letter, since he knew that over 400,000 French were taken prisoner during the war. In reality that number was far greater, being between 580,000 and 600,000. But returning to the story. One of the things that stunned Barthes was that their fruitless assaults were painted as a clear success by high command. They congratulated themselves because, according to them, they had advanced 500 meters and held firm to the conquered ground. They failed to mention that they had failed to push back the Germans one centimeter. All they had done was walk right into mortars, mines, grenades and machine guns. It seemed that to high command those 500 meters were worth all the corpses that now fertilized that small piece of Flanders. Barthes also comments that in their company there were some individual decorations, with common themes in their citations, such as being part of a group of 40 that volunteered to attack from a certain trench. Barthes said that these men should have refused these ridiculous croix de guerre and their lying citations but no one had the courage or shame to do it. After this, Bartha says they were all put to work day and night without relief digging parallel and communication trenches until December 23rd, despite the constant rain and cold. Sometimes German patrols would be spotted at night, and in their fear, the men thought they were full-fledged attacks. So mad volleys would ensue, which stirred up neighboring sectors, and also provoked the artillery of both sides to fire. Sometimes these were caused by nothing more than false alarms, given by nervous sentries who mistook bushes and shrubs moving the wind for pointed helmets. One night, Barthes' section was working ahead of the front-line trenches, when they saw shadows advancing along the railway. They opened fire and the shadows answered in kind. A reserve section rushed up to reinforce them, and they exchanged fire with the other side for more than an hour. But in the end, it turned out to have been a mistake. What they had taken for a German patrol was actually an advance outpost from their own company. Luckily, the outpost had taken cover behind the railway embankment, and Barthes' section was in a deep communication trench, so no one was injured. Here, Barthas concludes the notebook saying that these were the days of forced labor, without sleep or shelter, without even a little hole to be protected from the rain. Their feet turned blue and sore from the cold, and would swell up so much that they couldn't take their mud-caked boots off. Every night they had to dig a bit of trench that would be their campsite for the next day. When they were finally relieved, they were all so haggard, skinny, dirty and muddy, that they could not even recognize one another. And so we reach the end of the third notebook, with Barthas' first horrifying attack, senseless bloodshed, and the terrible manipulations and abuses by negligent superiors. It is only a first taste of what trench warfare was like, and it was rather gruesome. The only thing I can promise is that with time, and as the war evolves, 
things will get worse. On the next episode, we shall look at Barthes's fourth notebook, with the end of 1914 and the beginning of 1915, a new year of war. Until next time.